Today's guest on the podcast is Dr. Will Cole. He's a functional medicine expert and comes to us with his new book, The Inflammation Spectrum. I enjoyed this podcast as much as I did the prior one where he was on, I guess, about a year and two years ago, maybe. And I love everything that he represents um, from working on cooling the inflammation in our systems to being aware of how food, nutrition, environment impacts our health. I learned a lot in this episode, just as I did before, but I am very, very excited about his new book, The Inflammation Spectrum. This is speaking my language, you guys. I have learned so much about my body over the past five or six years and how much inflammation plays a role in my not only physical health, my body fat, but my mental health. Huge, huge stuff. So definitely listen to this one, pick up his new book, and enjoy this episode with Dr. Will Cole. Welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day. And it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Same 24 Hours podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Atwood. I am excited about our returning guest today. Dr. Will Cole is here. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for coming back. Your episode was a was a big one. So yay. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to talk again. So what have you been up to? It's been, I guess, what, two years, maybe <clears throat> going on. Two Has years. it been? Yeah. I wow. Think so. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Time flies. A eh? that's that's true. Uh, and I I've been up to a lot a lot a keto terry and my first book came out uh, and it's, it's sort of uh, it's this mostly plant-based ketogenic lifestyle guide uh, for people to learn how to go keto the clean way um, with vegan keto vegetarian keto and pescatarian keto options so my day job though is seeing patients so i see patients around the world via a webcam consultations at my functional medicine center. So that happens during the week. And then typically over the weekends, I have been traveling to different uh, cities uh, to talk about uh, ketotarian and uh, I love, I love it. So it's, it's cool. And I get to bring, I have two kids, I have a 13 year old and a 10 year old, and I normally get to bring one of them with me or my wife and all of us go to the different speaking events. So it's fun that I get to because uh, I don't get to see them when I'm seeing patients, obviously, right. at the clinic online. So it's fun that we get to kind of do these adventures and talk about what I love over the weekend, most weekends. And then uh, I started a new a podcast uh, with Goop. Uh, Goop is uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's um, wellness brand. And she, Gwyneth and Elise, uh, the chief content officer at Goop, uh, uh, host the main podcast, the Goop podcast. And then Seamus Mullen, who's a, an amazing chef and friend of mine, uh, him and I uh, host Goop Fellas, which is uh, a kind of a, a guy's perspective on wellness and talk, bringing, I think, more guys to the conversation that applies to them, but they don't know it applies to them <laughs> when it comes right. to different health topics. Um, because wellness is so female driven, I, I think giving a voice to people that don't really, they need to take responsibility for their life too. Um, guys do. And, we, and hopefully um, people can see themselves in the conversations we're having. So I'm doing that. And now my second book is coming out, The Inflammation Spectrum. I don't You're know how the heck busy. I'm doing. You've got so no. much free time. <laughs> yeah. The, the the same 24 hours, right? But... Oh man, I don't know if it applies to you when you just keep going. <laughs> no, it does. It does. And I've, you know, it's, but I'm really excited for the inflammation spectrum. It's this deep dive into this, uh, the science and research around inflammation, how it impacts our brain as far as anxiety and depression and fatigue and autoimmune conditions. We just deep dive into the science, make it easy to understand. And it's this, exploration of food and life itself that the factors that research shows are constantly and dynamically instructing inflammation cascades and how it's impacting so many people and they don't even know it. Yeah. So I'm really excited for people to read the inflammation spectrum. I'm super excited about it as well. I know you and I talked offline about my health <laughs> a couple years ago and yeah. 
I mean, I've cleaned up everything so much, so much. And then two weeks ago, my parents came in town and I just like forgot all of my nutritional and, you know, health morals. And I just went off the deep end with some, you know, not not bad food because we don't want to categorize anything as bad, but food that did not suit me. And it was (laughs) really weird because I became really crabby. I thought the world was ending. I hated everything. I and, and I thought back, there's no way that this is because of what I ate. And then I thought, it's exactly why. Yeah. <laughs> this is exactly why. So talk a little bit about how, like, the research behind, you, you mentioned depression, anxiety with nutrition. Like, how is this, how is this impacting us, really? Sure. Uh, and it's so important because the things that we're talking about here when it comes to anxiety, depression, brain fog, fatigue, um, like irritability and uh, inflammation, like uh, autoimmune conditions are just so there's such a rise of mental health issues and autoimmune conditions uh, and that commonality between those two things and many other things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer is chronic inflammation. Uh, inflammation by itself is not a problem. It, it, it fights viruses and bacteria. It's a, a, an amazing aspect of our immune system uh, and healthy, balanced, modulated uh, inflammation levels are needed for optimal human health, no doubt about it. The problem is when there's a breaking of the Goldilocks principle, you know, not too high, not too low, but just right at the right time. And that definitely applies to inflammation like it applies to our hormones, like it applies to our gut microbiome, bacteria, and it implies on a planetary level when it comes to our environment. It's about balance and homeostasis. So the problem with uh, inflammation when you talk about its implication in, in mental health issues or autoimmune conditions or all these other chronic health problems, it's it's chronic inflammation. It's inflammation that's too high for too long. And this sort of insidious uh, perpetuation of inflammation is an is- issue because inflammation in one area of the body can impact other areas of the body because the body's interconnect- interconnected. It's made up of cells and the crosstalk of cells and the communication of cells with hormones. Uh, neurotransmitters are being impacted. Um, so it is uh, the, it's the connection with that and food is every food we eat either feeds inflammation or fights it. There's no innocuous you know food. There's no benign meal. It's doing one or the other. It's mm-hmm. and there are there are foods that will serve one party or the other in bigger ways and some in smaller ways. Some are less uh, problematic. But they're doing one or the other. And because we're all individual, and this is the heart of functional medicine, bio-individuality, there's not a hard like line, one size fits all, broad sweeping general like recommendations other than eat real food. Okay, right. yeah, that that is the broad sweeping statement. But under the umbrella of eat real food and whole foods, what does that look like? And I've seen like good vegetables or good meats or good fruits or good whatever's uh, under the umbrella of whole real foods. One, it works great for one person and that same food can flare the next person up. This is bio-individuality. This has to do with our gut microbiome, has to do with genetics, has to do with hormone imbalances or hormone balances, has to do with all these different variables. This confluence of different genetic and epigenetic factors that determine how it's impacting inflammatory cascades in our body. So specific with anxiety and depression and the things you were talking about are just irritability and mood, uh, not being balanced or not feeling good mood wise. Uh, there's a whole field of, of research called the cytokine model of cognitive function. Basically, how does inflammation impact how your brain works? And we like to think that you know it's a mental health issue and it's a separate thing than our body but our mental health is physical health mm-hmm. and the things that we do in our life like physical things the foods that we eat impact our mood in many different ways it impacts brain chemistry it impacts hormone balance both of which will impact our mood and inflammation plays a major role of that communication of neurotransmitters and hormones uh, and specifically neuroinflammation is being looked at uh, in uh, the the dysfunction of anxiety, depression, and fatigue, and these mental health issues in a lot of cases. And obviously, there are 
external situations too or situational anxiety and situational depression but guess what our external circumstances like someone has a stressful job or a toxic relationship in their life or they're not getting enough sleep all of these external things are also instructing inflammation so it's not just about food it's definitely about circumstances as well but it's bi-directional you know our emotions and thoughts impact our physiology but our physiology also impacts our thoughts and emotions too so it is uh, something that these are the things I look at for my patients when we consult online um, but it's also the conversation and the questions that I'm asking in the inflammation spectrum for people to have that light bulb moment and say whoa I thought this was just normal. This isn't normal. I don't have to feel this background anxiety. I don't have to feel this debilitating fatigue, like living on sugar and caffeine just to get through the day and needing that nap. This is sadly uh, ubiquitous, these issues, but these are things that people in large part should not settle for because they're improvable and reversible and overcomable things um, in most cases. So uh, it's, it's definitely we have to look at food. We have to look at how it's impacting our mood and our hormones and our brain. Um, and we're just beginning the conversation and hopefully people can lean into this information to start improving their life. Right. And so many of us don't even realize that we feel bad. I mean, that's one of the themes I've noticed over the last probably five years, because I know you and I talked about it. I quit drinking and I didn't realize that drinking, I mean, I knew it wasn't making me feel great, but I didn't realize exactly how bad it was until I removed it. And yeah. a lot of us, I think, don't realize how bad we feel until mm -hmm. we get it straight. So what are some steps that you recommend in, in your book or just from a practical standpoint to, you said bio-individuality, how do people begin to figure out what works for them and how to quiet some of the noise, the nutritional noise that's out there? Yeah. And it is a, a, a what it's this strange dichotomy of the time that we live in it's there's a growing level of health problems that, that uh, have inflammation at its root or its commonality um, and we have this all this content on online uh, with when it comes to the health blogosphere and books to read and podcasts and all that stuff it's content on content and then you have both of these things rising at the same time it can be quite a disillusioning time for many people that don't feel well they know they're in tune with their body enough to know I want to feel better, right. um, but they don't know where to start. And I think that's a that's definitely the second point that I make in the inflammation spectrum. The first is just ed educating people that inflammation exists on a spectrum. And I actually do think that's a good place to start of checking in with your body. We open up the book with the inflammation spectrum quiz. Um, and the quiz that's in the book is also on drwillcole.com for free if people just want to take the quiz uh, and start there. Um, but we go through the different sections of the inflammation spectrum. We look at brain and hormones and digestion and musculoskeletal and detox. And we look at autoimmunity. We look at something called polyinflammation or the interconnectedness of the different systems of their body. So for example, we, t we keep using this example of mood um, imbalance or anxiety, depression or fatigue. Well, the gut's our second brain. It's formed from the same fetal tissue, meaning your gut and brain are formed as you're growing in your mom's womb. Your gut and brain are formed together. What? Uh, and are, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, it is. I feel it's, like it, I've heard your butt, your butt, your gut and brain are connected, but I didn't realize they yeah. actually were. Yeah. So the that. gut That's crazy. Born, and they're con interconnected the, for, the, for the rest of our life, inextricably linked for the rest of our life through the gut-brain axis is what it's referred to in the scientific literature and in functional medicine the, through the vagus nerve, the enteric nervous system. And if you think about it, the intestines even look like the brain uh, yeah. physically. Uh, and 95% of our serotonin, our happy neurotransmitter, is made in the gut, stored in the gut, not the brain. So that's the second brain, our, our, our intestinal oh system. So. This polyinflammation and looking at gut centric inflammation impacting the brain uh, is an example of polyinflammation. Inflammation in one area can beget inflammation in another area. Uh, and these are things that, again, we look uh, at. You can quantify on labs. You can look at it, things like intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome, dysbiosis, things like histamine intolerance, different food reactivities, and the impact that has on the brain. Um, so that is definitely something that people need to check in with their body and kind of see where the inflammation levels are at. Uh, and they can do that through the quiz subdiagnostically and just checking in with their body, or they can run labs. Uh, and these are labs that we run for patients 
all around the world, or they can get find a local functional medicine doctor or a regular doctor to run some of the labs because some of the labs are just basic low cost labs that any GP or PCP can can run. So things like high sensitivity C reactive protein or HSCRP, it's an inflammatory marker in functional medicine. We want it under one. Uh, homocysteine is a, another inflammatory marker. In functional medicine, we want homocysteine to be under seven. And you're saying uh, in functional medicine because like the averages for like normal outside of functional medicine are probably higher, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the and we probably talked about that the, in the first time we talked, but basically the reference ranges are based on a statistical bell curve average of people who go to that lab. So people that go to labs are not the healthiest bunch of people, sadly. Uh, and there's a lot of people that go to their doctor to say like, hey, I, I know I don't feel well. Like these symptoms are not normal for me. And these labs get ran, these basic labs, and then the labs come back like quote unquote normal, even though the person knows like, heck, like this isn't normal for me. These symptoms are definitely not normal but you're told you're just depressed here's an antidepressant or you just you're just getting older you're just, you're a new mom or all of these sort of well-intentioned reasons but it's like okay when the kids get older and you're not a new mom anymore and you still feel lousy okay what is it now so we have to start digging deeper and actually what's going on here physiologically um so that is uh, these are the things that we look at uh ferritin is another one that we run it's a, it's a biomarker for stored iron but and when it's higher, it can be considered what's called an acute phase reactant. So basically, when uh, the body's in a state of inflammation, ferritin can spike. And then we run more advanced labs, obviously, in functional medicine. Like those three that I just mentioned are labs that any doctor can run, any GP, PCP. You don't have to be in functional medicine. And then the other labs that we run in functional medicine are a little bit more advanced that we can run for people when it's clinically appropriate, obviously. But like, think, like uh, gut uh, in, inflammatory markers like calprotectin and ly lysozyme, uh, looking at methylation like MTHFR, these gene SNPs, look at, looking at the endocannabinoid system, which everybody's you know, hearing about CBD, CBD. Well, CBD, the, the compound that's in hemp oil, is, works on our cannabinoid, endocannabinoid system, uh, um, the ECS. That is throughout our body. And... Um, there are people with gene variants to these cannabinoid gene, uh, uh, gene SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, these gene variants basically that we're born with. Some people have more sluggish ca cannabinoid receptor sites, uh, what are called CB1 receptors. And the CB1 receptors are in our gut, in our, gastro our gastrointestinal system, our second brain. Uh, and those people that are, have these sluggish CB1 re receptors are more prone, it's shown in the studies, to have higher inflammation levels and more food reactivities and somewhere on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum that I talk about in the book. So it's this confluence of genetics and epigenetics. It's obviously predominantly epigenetics, lifestyle stuff, like so the foods we're eating or not eating, our stress levels, our exposure to toxins, our sleep, all of these stuff are instructing our genetics. Uh, but we have to look at genetics, too, because that is a, f a factor, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, these are the things that I think way too much about. <laughs> but but <laughs> it's hopefully... so fascinating. Oh, my gosh. But when you say inflammation, so let's say eight years ago, I would have thought, OK, well, I just need to take an leave for this inflammation because that's kind of what people think when they hear inflammation. So if you're talking to someone who's very new to functional medicine to their own health and they've just been pounding big macs for the last 20 years can you explain inflammation to them like a you know a very young child like what does it mean what does inflammation mean that you're talking about sure so inflammation is a product of the immune system again it's not inherently bad it's it fights vi viruses and bacteria it's healthy balanced inflammation is a good thing it's when we have a lack of balance that's the problem. So people think it's just musculoskeletal, like you said. People think it's just fibromyalgia maybe or arthritis or like you said, you have a headache. Maybe they can think about that as inflammation or just tight, sore muscles and joints. Those are all inflammatory, certainly. But that's just the musculoskeletal system. We also have to look at the other systems on the inflammation spectrum. We have to look mm -hmm. at the brain. We have to look at the immune system. We have to look at the gut. We have to look at the hor hormones. We have to look at all the different other uh, far-reaching 
uh, implications of inflammation, not just musculoskeletal. So yeah, the the the, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like the NSAID <clears throat> drugs definitely have educated people over the years <laughs> that that's a form of impl- inflammation, which fantastic. They've educated in that one category. Right. But I think there's a learning curve definitely on the other components of how inflammation can impact other parts of the body. So how are you seeing this showing up in children? Oh, my goodness. So it's something that I see in my clinic a lot on on an almost daily basis because <clears throat> it's not just impacting adults. We used to call these things you know, adult onset or these things, these chronic degenerative issues you could expect to increase as you aged. And it was sort of age-related health problem. But we're seeing an epidemic rise of inflammatory health problems in kids, not just in my clinic consulting online, but it's around the world um, from a statistic standpoint. The epidemic rise of things like ADHD, autism, uh, and autoimmune conditions like direct autoimmune conditions. And some researchers would consider autism in some cases having an autoimmune component um, for not, certainly not all cases. But um, – autoimmunity as well kids with Hashimoto's kids with kids with rheumatoid arthritis kids with lupus other autoimmune issues and then it's important to note that those are just diagnosable autoimmune conditions that the criteria for diagnosis for most of those health problems are happen years like that basically it took a long time to get to be where they're at in most cases obviously with kids it's going to not be as long as most adults it was a sudden onset it was a triggered response like type 1 diabetes where it could be overnight where the immune system turns against the pancreas and attacks it as in the case of type 1 diabetes or against the thyroid in the case of <clears throat> sorry Hashimoto's but for many people, these are chronic degenerative things and research estimates it's about seven to ten years prior to the diagnosis is when things start brewing. And obviously there can be less or more than that depending on the person that you're talking to. But no matter what age you're at, it's important to, you know, if you're a parent, to listen to your kids, to be mindful of kids, be advocates for your kids, and to um, do your due diligence. And not this isn't to put fear in parents. This isn't to, to, to become obsessive or stressed out this is really just saying hey look if your kids are feeling fantastic then great like there's no don't become obsessive about this but parents know and parents can see an epidemic rise around them even if it's not their own kids they can see the level of food reactions and food allergies in the school they can see the level of autoimmune conditions they can see the level of autism in the school like their kids they're their, their kids' friends and the other schoolmates that are there. I mean, this is was not going on to this degree just a couple a decades ago. Right. Um, but yet, you it would be hard pressed to find a school without some sort of severe food allergy. Well, what are these? These are immune mediated issues. These are inflammatory problems. So, with having your two children. <laughs> How do you, how do you guys eat? I mean, this is, this is such a challenge. I mean, we try and feed our kids healthy. We, you know, we cook at home, we do all this stuff, but then they get to school and they're sharing food with their friends. My kids don't eat school lunch, but, um, like, how do you raise kids to be healthy in this culture? I mean, it is so difficult, even with best efforts at home. It is. It's definitely difficult. Uh, I would say you just going back to my earlier statement of knowing your kids and speaking to them in a language that's age appropriate, that is filled with grace and, uh, balance and not being overly dogmatic or shaming or obsessive or creating a disordered eating, which I think Mm -hmm. can really happen in this space, especially amongst girls. So I think it's really important to just really less is more in many ways and teach Instead of focusing on all the things they can't have, focus on all the yummy things they get to have and finding healthy alternatives to the things that they love. So let's say it's like, um, you know, chicken nuggets or fries, find like the gluten free or even grain free or make your own chicken nuggets and, and bread it in, um, flour it with uh, almond flour instead of regular flour or the, the, the fries, uh, fry them in avocado oil 
or you know something other than a bad like canola oil or the air fryer the air fryer there you go the <laughs> ma magic of the air fryer right. um the but then obviously you mentioned like with school i think that that informing the kids uh, as early as you can and obviously we all are having this aha moment at different points in our kids ages and you can't go back and change the things from the past and we right. all there's not a parent under the sun that didn't wish they could do things better. Like we all wish we could go back and do some things better when it comes to parenting, but we can't. So what we have to do is start now, no matter if your kids are teenagers or they're younger, it's easier when they're younger because you can start to change things and it won't be, it'll just be more second nature the more that they live with that. But what I found with my kids, and they're definitely not perfect eaters, they don't eat everything perfect. And I think that's important to say, but they know my imperfect kids, my my kids that are just like every other kids will know when I'm at so and so, they'll ask the ingredients for it. And it's not because I even told them to ask it. They just it was just the way that it was. They'll say, hey, is, is that gluten free? Um, and my kids don't have any autoimmune conditions, thank God. But they have like my son doesn't feel good whenever he has gluten. Right. So he'll feel like more like digestive issues or he has the, some inflammatory symptoms and he knows for himself he won't it's not worth it for him my daughter has some d different foods they just know their body i think and they they rather feel better than they miss that food and occasionally their kids they'll have that food that they know that that doesn't work for them but it's still informing them and just like with adults we can take inventory for ourselves and say was that worth it right. i probably do, i won't do it like that again if I have that again, I'll probably have less of it. And it's that sort of awareness that I want my kids to grow into. So it's not punitive. It's not dogmatic. It's not making them so orthorexic where they're having stress and shame about healthy eating. So it's definitely – and that those same rules apply for the adults. That is, say, the same rules have to apply to mom and dad too right. or any parent. So I think that uh, that's that's what I try to do with my kids. It's a little bit easier because my kids are homeschooled um, for me, but they weren't always homeschooled. Right. And it, it, for my patients, it's the other level. Like, not I can't think of any other patients that, of mine that are kids that are homeschooled. So I'm used to making this practical and realistic on a professional level. Um, and my kids still have sleepovers and go over to their friend's house, so I still know what that's like. Um, and it's it's just a matter of doing the best you can with the resources you have and the access you have. It's definitely harder with blended families. It's harder with, you know, if you're at mom's house one day, one week and dad's house the next week, it's harder um, because if you're not on the same page. Uh, but I am used to navigating that uh, and trying to get all the parents on the same page. Yeah. So you mentioned at the start of the podcast that you, um, on your podcast, are, are working towards making men more aware of their health issues because women are always talking about it. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you see in, for men and perhaps, you know, dads, I guess, that's probably the demographic here. Um, what are some of the challenges that, that you see and that you're addressing, like in your work? Uh, it's interesting because I, I'm seeing higher than ever numbers of guys as patients consulting them online. Uh, and I think it is pod there. It is the uh, rise of podcasts and informing people. Um, and they, that's how they're learning. And their guys are not so much on social media, uh, where they're kind of sharing it in the same way that women are sharing it on social media, but guys are learning through podcasts off of social media in many cases and then becoming informed that way. And I, I have – like over these past 11 years of doing this in functional medicine, I have seen the rise and a lot of them actually come from podcasts. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and I think that the, the barrier is guys just being in tune with their body. I think it's just that they – are good at putting things off and procrastinating and a lot of moms are good at that too um, of just putting themselves in the back burner but I think guys are not necessarily doing it from a selfless place <laughs> where right. I think I think moms are doing it because they're selfless and they're just putting their family first which they need to they only can give what they have so that's the message to moms there and putting their health first because not feeling your best is not you're not going to be able to be the best mom or wife or partner that you can be. Um, but on the flip side, I think guys are putting themselves in the back burner. But it's like 
they just don't want to look at it. They're kind of just ignoring it in many ways or they're downplaying it or they're comparing themselves to other people and saying, ah, it's normal. Um, or they're putting their job first and they're right. putting like other I was things. I say that pressure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I have to, I don't have time to take off of work. I don't, I don't even have time for a doctor's appointment. Uh, and it's just not a high priority, right? Because we all make time for things that we have a passion for. We all have make times for things that are time for things that are important to us in most cases of course there's exceptions to that rule but what i've found is that most people and again almost all of my patients are just normal working class people what i've seen that over this human behavior over this past 11 years of doing this is that most of the time people the excuses are just that they're excuses and ultimately if something's important to us we have that wake up call we make things happen even if it, even if we need to schedule it out and work it with our schedule we need to make our health a priority. And that applies to almost everybody. Um, and I, we do everything we can to make this more accessible and more affordable and more realistic for the average person because we know that it's a barrier for some people. Right. Um, so we definitely keep that in mind uh, and have made bigger measures to do that um, to, co- to provide the support that people need at this time. But I think the guys are waking up. And I think that it's a it's connected to this larger societal waking awakening that's happening um and i think guys are starting to realize well i should probably listen to my wife or i should probably listen to my <laughs> my partner about this uh thing you know and it's not just someone nagging me this is actually real and i need to do i need to do right by myself like if someone's you you cannot care more for someone somebody's health than they care about their health and people need to have that wake up call to care about their health um, no matter what that looks like right how do you encourage people to so that someone will come to you they'll want to change some things but then I you know I I do some life coaching with women and I notice they'll come they'll be like super excited for two weeks and then they'll just disappear and then we'll have a, a re-engagement you know to talk about what's going on and and they just seem to not have the, I don't want to say motivation, or I don't want to say discipline or anything. I don't want to use those words, but they don't seem to have the awakening, I guess would be Mm -hmm. a good word. How, even though they know they want it, there's just this, and you can see it, I can see it, we can all see it. But how do you bridge that gap to help people realize, you know, how do you help them have that light bulb moment that Mm -hmm. this is what they want? This is why they came to you. Like, this is exactly what they want. How do you help them with that? Totally. I see that. I do see that um, quite frequently, actually. Um, And where they have enough of an awakening to get them to that point right? where they are at the consult, they are not in denial, but they self-sabotage. And I think that that is a major problem. And it's coaching them through that. I think we're uh, meeting them where they're at. They're not going to be perfect. And that's like and this is a conversation that I'm always having with my team and we're going back and forth on it is that. Sometimes you have to you're giving too much too soon for someone that doesn't have a vessel for what you're giving them. And sometimes it's better to be incremental and leaning into something because at least you're progressing versus saying, well, you have to do all or nothing. And if you don't do all, you're a failure because that's how they feel. So that's where they if they're not meeting the standards of whatever they're putting, if they're putting them, the standards on themselves or they feel like they're letting you down, they just feel like, well, I'm just going to give it all up. And then then they feel the guilt and shame and remorse and then they go back and it's just back and forth back and forth and it's really a remnant of this dieting culture that we have where it is based it's shame based really and i think shifting the paradigm from a shame based perspective on wellness whatever that means whether that's food wellness or life wellness or whatever uh, mental physical spiritual emotional wellness is to not have it come from a shame based place but have it from a, a place of grace and have it come from a place of we are going to meet you where you're at and you progressing in, the, in a positive direction is better than you not progressing at all, even if it's slower, even if it's at your own pace um, and not comparing themselves to like the perfect patient or the perfect client. Um, because ultimately that what I found is that if you're incremental with somebody and you sort of just hold space for them, even while they're self-sabotaging. 